Thanks everyone for being with us and welcome to today's Stanford Pain Management Pain Science Lecture Series. This series was, was created by Dr. Heather Papoor King. She is a pain psychologist at Stanford Pain Management. And this series allows our providers to share useful information with the community each month. I'm Anaida Kalyanibala. I am the moderator with you this evening. I'm a pain psychology fellow in the clinic and our presentation will be given by Dr. Wakabia. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. David Wakabia, who is one of our pain medicine fellows and presenting on central nervous system and pain this evening. All right, thank you, Anahida. I appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. I am David Wakabia, one of the pain fellows at Stanford Pain Medicine, and I will be talking about brain and pain, the central nervous system and pain. Um, the good news about this talk is that it gives you the opportunity to actually have an in-depth understanding of how your pain happens and the connections that the body has and an overview of what you can do when it comes to the connection of your body wiring and your pain itself. And our objective for today will be focusing first, let's understand what the central nervous system is and then what it does to pain. So that combination, we will just go in depth on that area. I would say when I start, um, there will be some big words that I would say, I'll try to make them very small, but the underlying thing is that I'll always remind us of the main thing that we need to take away from the slide so that when you, you go back home and you're on your own, you can think about those words instead of focusing on the very big words. And another pain objective that we have today is your perception. How does the perception, how your understanding or how you feel affect your pain? It's more about the mind and body, the connection between all this, how it all ties down together. And then finally, one of the things we always talk about is looking at the pain medications that we do take, the ones that we all know. Where does it fall in the central nervous system? Where is it that these medications play a role in and what do they affect? So that way, when you do take them, you can actually also picture in your mind where these medications are. And after that, we would also review the summary again. So we will That's begin with, here. so I will start with the definition of pain. Pain is an adversary sensory and emotional experience typically caused by that um, that resembles an actual or potential tissue damage. Um, this definition is very important to have in mind because at the end of the day, I'm gonna go back to that slide again because I want to spend some more time on it. Um, the goal for us to understand that your pain is not necessarily triggered by a damage or a trauma or something that we can actually lay our fingers on. It can be triggered by something else that resembles trauma and sometimes it doesn't involve tissue injury. And initially we, we always thought that, you know, your pain has to have a connection to a damage or a tissue damage or something that you can always lay your hands on. And if there is nothing that we can attribute or point our fingers as the contributor to your pain, then that pain isn't real. But the definition that we now have allows us to put in into emotion, you know, the idea that all pain might not be attributed to a particular trauma or tissue injury. And it allows us to have a very broad definition that can encompass the pain that people go through. So this is very important. So we go back to what is the central nervous system. I will begin with the image we are seeing right now. The nervous system itself is defined as the electrical wiring. You know, it's the wire that connects every component of the body and it's very, very complex. It, com it has neurons, it has cells, and all of them come together and they go through and they transmit information back to the brain and then from the brain back to the body, the fingers, everywhere. And then this allows the communication and this allows the body to feel pain. I will go in more details in the subsequent slides. Now, it's divided into about four major components of which the central nervous system is one. It's actually the command center of your body. You think of, you know, where everything is being controlled. 
is in the central nervous system. Either the pain, the food you eat, and everything we do is being controlled by this component of the body. And then, of course, we have the cranial nervous system, which constitutes of the brain, the eyes, the ears, and other things that come together to actually picture and capture images that we can actually um, perceive with our feelings. Then going to the peripheral nervous system, you can think of this as the periphery, you know, the nerve endings that you have in your fingers, the nerve endings you have everywhere in your body, in the feet, you know, so if something happens to you, the peripheral nervous system is responsible to take this information from that periphery and take it all the way to the brain via the communication channels that is already established. And the last components that I want to talk about is autonomic nervous system. You can think about this as the flight and fight. It's called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the job of this is designed to allow your body to respond if something happens without your brain even being aware. A good example is if there is something that happens all of a sudden, let's say you or you had an accident, the sympathetic kicks in, your heart begins to race, and multiple things begin to happen without you even knowing. Another example is if you have your eyes open and something is about to fall into it, the reflex that you actually have is to close that eyes. So that kind of behavior is all being captured by the autonomic, autonomic nervous system. We cannot change it by whatever we do. That's designed to protect your body and it's everywhere. This is the reason why your heart beats. No matter what you do, you cannot say, my heart, okay, stop beating now. Or you cannot think about your breathing. You breathe whether you want it or not. Even if you decide not to breathe on your own, after a while, you can try to hold your breath for like two minutes or so. After a while, it will be overridden by this system that allows you to take that breath. So that's the other component of our body. And yes, this component of the body is also responsible for pain. Sometimes, you know, things that are much more, um, there's an overdrive of one aspect of this autonomic nervous system. So you have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. They're supposed to be perfectly aligned as a yin and yang. One shouldn't be bigger than the other. But I'm sure most people on this slide could have heard about something like complex regional syndrome, like CRPS. It's because the aspects, or one of the aspects of this autonomic nervous system begins to override the other. The sympathetic system begins to be louder than the parasympathetic. And if this happens, it revs up the whole system. And at the end of the day, it will cause pain. So it's really great to understand a little bit, you know, how this all comes into play, because I'm sure with everybody on the call, some of us might have had things like CRPS or might have other things that is actually being triggered by one aspect of the central nervous system. So that's why I spent a lot of time on this slide. Now, if you have questions or anything, I know is quite a bit from the beginning, you can always put in questions in the chat and we can revisit this aspect, but this is the meat of what we want to talk about, and we will reference that. So subsequent slides are going to be very detailed. Um, what I did was a little bit high level, but I'm going to go down a little bit from the ground. You know, it, it would require me to be very detailed, but I don't want to lose us. So I'll always try to summarize what we want to have at the end of the day. But this is a very high level slide that allows us to have a very good picture of where we'll be going with this talk. So we'll begin with your pain. You know, we can understand this image. It's very easy for us to see. You know, you have your finger, something happens to your finger. Maybe you are closing a door and the door all of a sudden closed on your hands and it's really painful. And the first thing you do is you're gonna withdraw from that pain. And when this happens, we can imagine there is a direct transmission that goes through your body from that finger, goes to the nerves that you have in the finger, and it transmits all the way to the spinal cord. The spinal cord manages and does something to this pain and then transmits it all the way to the brain. The brain reads it as a pain signal, like, wow, this is really painful. And the brain will release what we call endorphins. 
And a classic example of this is when you have, um, let's say you are involved in a motor vehicle crash. I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but initially when the crash happens, you would realize that you feel no pain because this endorphins actually happens and just revs up all your system and you don't feel the pain, it's because the body is releasing the natural stored endorphins. Think of it as the natural body opioids. The body just releases it so you don't feel much. And this is because of your sympathetic system has revved up a little bit. After a while, this goes away and the pain, you begin to feel the pain. So this is a very high level slide, of a very straightforward behavior between the connection between your pain and the behavior of the brain and how it responds. To go further into this, we have to talk about, again, another slide that has that, but then we'll begin to get into nociception, which will be the next slide. Nociception is basically your body's reaction to pain. How is it perceived? How is it transmitted? What happens? So again, the finger, as we notice area, it is it, maybe you have it done up there, it is carried by very little nerve fibers called dendrites that is in the fingers. And that is being transmitted all the way into a nucleus synapses and goes through the spinal cord. And then it's being transmitted all the way to the cerebral cortex, which is the center where everything happens. And when this happens again, you have an interpretation that is sent all the way back from that area in your brain, all the way to the hands that will cause two things. Either you pull your hands away from the painful stimuli and of course, the release of those endorphins to help reduce the pain. So in details, nociception is, like I said, your body's reaction to painful stimuli. What happens? So this is an example of telling you the other ones we talked about, we were using the fingers, but this slide is abdominal pain. Yes, that could be also triggered and will cause the same behavior as putting your finger in the fire or putting your finger in a doorknob and it closes on that. The same thing happens in abdominal pain. Basically, there is an inflammation, you know, and there is some sort of injury or some sort of trauma that is triggered in the abdominal walls. And then you can see the impulse and the pain signals being carried away by these nociceptors of the cell body, they are sitting both in the peripheral, in the abdomen, and also in the spinal cord. Now, when it gets to the spinal cord, emerging it, crossing over to the other side, and this is sent forward all the way to the brain. And you, as you can see, the center of that pain is around your cortex. And this is how we perceive pain. And this is a classic response to your pain. Now, the beauty of nociception is, is a protective stimuli because you can imagine if we don't have nociception, we would walk into fire without knowing. And um, I'll give an example now about diabetic neuropathy. Um, people that have diabetes, you've heard about them, you know, having injuries without knowing. And this is a classic case when we've lost the nociception because you then you don't have the ability to perceive this pain and you can be bleeding or something could happen to you and you would not know. So you can begin to appreciate the importance of nociception as a concept. It's both protective and is designed to help you manage your pain. So we will start with a very in-depth analysis of how this happens and where we go from here. So I always will preface this with, we go back to the first slide we saw, like we can see in this cartoon, this kid has a foot injury and the foot injury basically is gonna be sensed by all the fibers in the leg. And we have two fibers that's always there. You have the slow fibers called the C fibers and then the fast fibers called the A fibers. And the goal of these two things is to carry the pain you have from the site of injury. It goes all the way into the spinal cord through what we call an afferent nerve fiber. Afferent means it's coming from the affected part of the body and the goal is to send that to the brain. So it goes into and goes through the spinal cord and then it goes for your pain. There is a particular tract that we normally talk about 
you don't have to remember this, but there's a tract called the spinal thalamic tract that the job for this is to carry the pain and then set it up all the way. And then it goes through the dosal ganglion, which is another region where of importance. At, at the end of the day, it takes it all the way through the vein, through the brain stem, passes the brain stem, goes through the reticular formation and through the pons, and then ends up in the cortex. Now, I'm going to talk more about the cortex and the limbic system and the thalamus in the latter slide. But in this slide, I want you to appreciate the complexity of how your pain is managed. It's really not as complex as it might sound, but the goal is that the body is ready to actually respond to your pain injury at any time with a very, very um, you know, regulated system in play. So this is called the ascending pathway, meaning the ascending information being triggered and taken up all the way to the brainstem. Now, the slide here, all you have to remember from this slide is that in your skin or your leg, there is all these nerve fibers and you know they are all there. The, the goal for that is to actually capture information any kind of information. It can be a pain signal. It can be cold. It can be warm. It can be anything. And the goal is these free nerve endings will capture this information. And once they capture it, they take it all the way down through the ganglion, the cell body that's sitting in most part of the body. And at the end, it takes it all the way to the neurons and then to the central nervous system. And you can appreciate this more. It's a more detailed slide, but all I want you to remember, you know, as I go through this slide is that when you have an injury, when you have a cut, let's say you have um, basically, um, you have an injury that allowed your body to, you know, just, you, you cut your finger or, you know, you, you had an accident, there is multiple signals that is released or multiple neurotransmitters that is released. And the job of all this is to cause some changes to actually prevent more injury and also help your body to adapt to the pain. So when you have an injury, you can see here, let's say heat or any other things, your body does multiple things. There is a histamine release from the cells that has been affected or bradycanin, there is the interleukins, and then of course there's a the tumor necrosis factor. All these things basically begin to trigger the pain perception. And if you, if things are not taken care of at this level, if things are not managed, this will turn into a situation where you have chronic pain. So at first your body will try to fight it and heal and do multiple things and actually begin to regulate the circulation of all these neurotransmitters by actually inhibiting it. We'll talk about it in a future slide, but the goal of this slide is to realize that once there's an injury, there is multiple neurotransmitters that is released. Some of them are there to help with the pain and some of them are there to make the pain worse. So some of our pain medications that we use actually will target some of this release, either to make them higher or stay longer or take them out of the system. So at the end of the day, the question is how can we make the tissue damage and the inflammatory markers that we have on the system less so that we can feel better. We can talk about that at the other section when we talk about the medications later on. So this is another high level slide that is basically talking about things we can do. So um, we start with the neurotransmitters and I don't wanna make it sound complex, but if you look from the slide A, you see, this is our A and A beta fibers and the C fibers that I talked about. And this, we are assuming, this section of it, we are assuming is the area where we have had an injury. And um, if truly, let's see here, if truly you have the injury, this is supposed to go to the fibers, the C fibers, and there is a release of glutamate, which is one of the things that we will talk about in the future. The glutamate is one of the neurotransmitters that we that is beneficial if the control of glutamate allows the body to better manage pain. And then 
Of course, on the other side, you have the TNF alphas, you have the interleukins. These are inflammatory markers. Our goal is to reduce these inflammatory markers because they're the things that make you feel pain more. And if you think about ibuprofen, ibuprofen and other in anti-inflammatory medications, what they are working on is to reduce at the end some of these inflammatory markers to make your pain feel better and make you feel better. So at the end of the day, once this is complete, we are going to zoom in to what happens in the brain. Now we've talked about how the how the pain transmits from the spinal cord up onto the brain. Now, what part of the brain are we talking about? There is about four or five regions that is very important to us. The prefrontal cortex, which is the PFC. We have the amygdala, we have the thalamus, we have the periaphotal gray. Now, these are all the areas where your pain signal is transmitted. And things actually will make sense when we talk about pain perception briefly, but the amygdala, the prefrontal context, and all that has a role that they actually do play in actually managing. So let's talk about briefly the descending pathway. So I always say this, whatever goes up must come down. So as we can imagine, we've talked about your pain starting from the fingers and going through the spinal cord and then going all the way to the cortex, the amygdala, and what happens with that information? You remember I talked about endorph endorphins being released. How are they released? What does the body do? How does it interpret you know, that endorphins should be released? This is caused by the descending pathway. So whatever goes up must come down. So in the descending pathway, it's, 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 it's just the way of the body to say, this is what I want to do for this pain. So it starts all the way from either the single cortex, it can start from the, the sensory cortex as well. It can start from the hypothalamus as well. But what this does is that it, it combines all the fibers and all the information that has happened. And what it does is sends it first all the way down to the periapital gray matter, which is in the midbrain. Here, there is a couple of interactions that actually happens. At the midbrain, the local cellulose is another component that also helps regulation. This combines with information in the periapital gray and then is transcended down to the medulla, where it's interpreted. And then what happens from the medulla is that it decides to send multiple pain signals. And this is where you have the nucleus raphae, which is where the 5-HT sits. 5-HT is um, a transmitter that we have to remember is a serotonin, which if you remember is a feel-good hormone. So we can trick our body to release high amount of serotonin by this, which also mitigates and inhibits your pain. However, as the pain begins to come down, it comes down all the way back down to the spinal cord where you're gonna have information released that says, I'm gonna inhibit the transmission of all the painful stimuli neurotransmitters. For example, it will say, we do know that the housing is gonna produce pain for you. We can limit the amount you're gonna have or transmit or have in the, the nerve endings. It can actually begin to say, well, we want more dopamine to be in the system. So we're gonna inhibit all the things that will cause the, 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 the dopamine uptake at that time. So the information being sent all the way from the brain is to say, how can we mitigate your pain? So it's sending inhibitory information to allow or stop the transmission of the neurotransmitters that would normally cause your pain that we discussed earlier. So that is the goal of the descending pathway. So it's to make sure that information is sent to the spinal cord to begin to mitigate some of the elements of your pain. So that's the summary of this slide. So going back again, you know, we remember we talked about the ascending pathway, the descending pathway. The ascending pathway allows you to send information all the way to the brain, to the central nervous system. And the descending pathway is to bring that information and say, this is what you're supposed to do for that. So that's how that works. Now, the next slide is pain perception. I think this is critical and I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this. The perception of your pain is key to so many of our pain syndrome. What 
is the mind and body connection. You know, you, 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 I'll give an example. Let's say I am, um, my wife just gave birth to um, a twin baby boy and I am all the way in, um, let's say I am in Afghanistan and something has happened to me, you know, normally I would have a very big reaction to the pain. Let's say I have a pepper cut in an office, you know, normally the pepper cut will not be painful or might be painful depending on your mind or your state of mind. But if you have a happy news somewhere or you're about to go on a vacation, all of a sudden, painful stimuli that you normally would be like, oh my God, this is crazy, stops being painful. And what happens? How does this happen? Or even sometimes you are, you can imagine someone um, having, you know, a root canal or one of those simple procedures. And the dentist goes, imagine yourself in a beach. Imagine yourself in um, some island, you know, and imagine nice things. And you, as you begin to imagine this, your pain is changed. Your pain becomes less. But no one gave you any medication. And this actually allows you to have a better control. It's as if your mind has taken over. And the system is still having the nociception that we talked about. We're still perceiving the pain, but somehow your mind has overridden the fact that there is a pain symptom and you begin to feel less of this. So, and this goes in a very broad step. So let's start from mood. When you are depressed, when you have anxiety, when you have things that are not going the way you want, we tend to perceive pain more. So this begins to make us wonder, there is something in the brain that actually responds to our emotions and the pain part. We will talk about that briefly, but this is very important for everyone on the call to remember that your mood affects how you feel and your pain flares. And so if you're in a very happy mood, you know, let's say you have an expectation, which could be the contest, you know, you just have the baby or you're about to go on a vacation, you know, things are less painful. So this brings the power of mind and the connection between the mind, the body, and the brain to be a very powerful modulator of our pain. So we go back to cognition. So cognition is, like I said, I talked about, you know, when people distract you. The same thing can, be ha can happen where, if you remember, let's say you have a toddler that is on the floor and they just fell. And if the mom just says, oh, you're okay, sweetie, just come up, this is not the problem, you know, the toddler gets up without even thinking about it. However, if the toddler falls and the mom screams, oh my God, this is bad, this is no, and then you can see that toddler, you know, begin to cry because they just have been, there's, a, there's no distraction and there's some element of catastrophizing that is being there. And as you can notice, depending on how this happens, this is how coping skills are developed from, you know, when you're small to when you get older, because if you're used to not, you know, you have a way of actually allowing your brain to actually focus, it just does a whole lot of wonders for your pain perception. Now, other things that could affect or change the perception of your pain is um, medications or other things that you could have. Let's say you have a neurodegeneration or you have some elements of disease in your system that changes the chemical structure or you are on any medications that begin to change the, the structure of your dopaminergic system, meaning the dopamine is reduced or anything that affects the serotonin system or the operatic system would also affect your pain. So the ability of your body to release its natural endorphins or the ability of your body to release its natural dopamine is reduced because of this. And this goes back to things like exercise. Why is it that when we exercise so much, we feel better? Now, this is all from here because then you are activating that feel good hormone. You know, you see all the runners, they want to run so much and because they love the runners high. And this is where this is coming from. So the a body has ability to actually, you know, send this hormones to make you feel better. And that's why sometimes physical activity is the best thing for you to do for your pain because at the end of the day, it allows your body to begin to do what it does best, which is adjust and actually have a better coping strategy. So that's what this slide is all about. Of course, the injury is there. 
which is the initial problem that we have. But I did a slide in opposite way. I didn't start from the injury this time around because we've already done that already. But I want us to start with the pain experience, starting from the context and come down. So the injury is always there. It's always the initial insult that happens. This is where people can get sensitized. And this is where it all begins. So the importance of this slide is, which I'm going to go over here as well in this next slide is, this is the complex one, but the first one, all you gotta remember is your emotions and all the things I talked about affect your pain. Now, this is how this happens in your brain. So this is all the aspects of your brain where they are being factored in and where things are being changed. The prefrontal cortex is where you have the cognition done. And then you, of course, you have the amygdala and then you have the periaquita gray, all this, is where your pain is all being factored and integrated into one. And this is all the areas where you have changes that lead to your chronic pain history. And as you can see, all the areas of the brain is involved and it puts it all together. And again, this regulates your nociception and this regulates what you're gonna do and how you're gonna behave. And this is all factored in, into the descendant that way that we talked about. So this is a great slide and I would spend time on this and because I think I love this slide the best because I know all we are see, all sitting in the corner like, oh yeah, I'm taking all this medication. Where does he even fall in? Uh, which part of the, um, which part of the pathway is my medications? So I will start with trauma. When we have the initial trauma, what can we do to reduce the inflammation? Remember what I talked about all those inflammatory markers that were coming up? And there's multiple drugs that we can take that would affect the area where the initial injury happens. And one of them is NSAIDs or anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or Celebrex or naproxen. You know, these medications affect the area where the initial trauma happens to reduce the inflammation. Another medication that works here is local anesthetics. Lidocaine, which we all know. That's why when you go to the dentist, they can inject it in your mouth and then do all those work and then you don't feel the pain. So it's working at the nerve endings. The local anesthetic also works on the nerves that transport, transform pain all the way to the dorsal ganglion. And it works there and changes multiple things there. Now getting to the dorsal horn, which is one of the areas that it has to happen the pain has to go through that area to get to the brain for it to be perceived. Meaning, if you can stop the transmission of the pain from the dorsal horn, the brain will never know there was an injury. So this is where your opioids work. Things like your um, your oxycodone, you know your your you know hydrocodone, all those work in the area called the dorsal horn, and. You have other medications like the lidocaine as well would work on this area as well. And then finally, you have the clonidine of this word. The, the, I'm sure most of us have heard of that before. We use it for pain. We also have the tizanidine, which is another um, alpha-2 agonist. And the job for this alpha-2 agonist is to actually tone down your sympathetic system. And... Um, this helps in clear cases like where you have CRPS. Um, this medication's goal is to tone down the sympathetic if they are being wrapped up by any kind of tissue injury or sensitization. Now, if no medications, if we don't stop the pain at the dorsal horn and it gets all the way to the brain and we can still do something, the opioids are still able to go to the brain and all the areas we talked about, because there's opioid receptors everywhere in the body. There's some in the spinal cord, there's some in the brain, and wherever the receptors are, the opioids will work there. So the opioid would also work in your brain as well, including the alpha-2 agonist. And if all this fails, you know, your body still has the ability to send down signal that will actually inhibit some of the pain signal, and this is being done by the descendant pathway. So this is a very great slide to just have you know, an idea of how the pain medications work and where they work. So in summary, um, I'd like us to remember um, two things. There is always 
a stimulus. There's always a damage that happens. And when that damage happens, what your body does to that, to respond to that is called nociception. And with the nociception, your pain pathway or your pain signals are transported all the way from the spinal cord, all the way to the brain, to the cortex, to the limbic system. And that is sending every system, sending important information all the way down again. Now, in the limbic system, there is the emotional response and the stress response. This is an aspect of pain that I didn't go into it much, but it's the suffering and the pain that is associated with your pain symptom. While the thalamus has all the sensory relay and all the good stuff and the cortex, this limbic system and the hypothalamus are the ones that actually processes the suffering that is associated with your pain. So, and then the interpretation of this is as a result of your brain putting everything together and then sending awareness back to your spinal cord all the way to the periphery to have an action which can be pulling away from a painful stimuli, releasing of endorphins to help with the pain and other neurotransmitters that will help your body feel better. And lastly, I'll always remind us about the definition of pain. The fact that pain is um, basically at the end of the day, not necessarily a trauma or injury, but it can be perceived as one, which is also important because in the slide when I talked about these medications and you have trauma there, it doesn't have to be trauma. It can be anything else. It can be an emotional response to something else. But overall definition allows us to know that even though there is no physical manifestation or physical injury that we can see, that there is a chance that your pain is being triggered by something else that we do not know and is a very, very complex system. And here are the references in the law or some of the things I would like us to look about. You know, the Lorimer book with Butler is great. You can go back and there's a TED talk and Curable app is great. It just is all about mind and body. I've seen so many patients come into the clinic. They use this, it's helped so many people. And I would always recommend that. And I'm sure Anahita has shared that to you guys as well. But um, this brings me to the end of it, and I would hand it over back to Anahita. Mm -hmm.